Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Joe Jaspers. I'm the former surveillance coordinator. Uh, and like Kem Lini said, I'll be presenting with Rwand, who is the current uh, epidemiology technical advisor for IRC based in New York. And we're going to be presenting on the evaluation of a national community based surveillance system for Ebola virus disease in Sierra Leone. We've divided up the presentation, so as a former field staff, I'll be speaking more about the implementation, and then Rowan will take over to talk in more detail about some of the methodology uh, and the key findings from the evaluation. So I'm sure, as with Camelini, many of you probably had a degree of personal involvement with the outbreak, uh, but for those who are unaware, to put this in sort of context, there were three primary sources for identifying Ebola cases in mid to late 2014. Cases could uh, present to health facilities, in which case they'd be screened, uh, there was a national hotline set up in Sierra Leone wherein community members could report suspected cases and deaths occurring in their villages. And then, of course, for known chains of transmission, there was contact tracing. The challenge that we encountered uh, was that many cases and many chains of transmission were not known. So this is the epi curve for the first 50 weeks of the outbreak. And you can see that in beginning in September 2014, uh, there begins uh, a gradual increase or steady increase in the number of cases uh, that were dead when they were detected first. This is obviously important from an individual standpoint in that delays in seeking treatment dramatically reduce the chances for survival, but also from a public health standpoint in that these cases remained in the communities uh, and were able to continue transmitting the virus on to others. Obviously, once they died, uh, the bodies of, of Ebola victims are highly viremic, and so that also served as an additional means of further furthering transmission. So it was in response to these challenges that we designed a program called Community Event-Based Surveillance uh, with the objective of limiting geographic spread of the outbreak by improving the sensitivity and the timeliness of case detection. So this system was essentially sacrificing specificity uh, and gaining, hopefully, the speed uh, in detecting cases quicker. Um, we did that through training a network of community health monitors at the village level to detect and report on a list of a standardized list of events uh, that were associated with the Ebola transmission. They're on the right here. I won't go into them in detail, um, but just to say that we thought that training them on an event-based system as opposed to a case-based system would be quicker uh, and would be easier for community health monitors to apply and interpret as opposed to training everybody in the clinical case definition. So the design was really exhaustive active surveillance at the village level. This is a structure of sort of how the um, alerts <coughs> flow through the system. So beginning on the left, for example, say there was a trigger event that occurred in the community. One of the trigger events was uh, a traveler arrives in the village and becomes sick or dies soon after arriving. That would hopefully be detected by a community health monitor who would relay the alert up to a supervisor. The supervisor would then work with the community health officer, which is the Ministry of Health staff, to conduct a preliminary investigation of the alert to determine if it fit uh, the criteria for a suspected case. If so, the alert would be forwarded to the District Ebola Response Center, which was a government structure set up, uh, and a formal case investigation team would be dispatched to uh, determine if it was a confirmed case to isolate the case and get it lab testing. So the yellow boxes are the components that were added by community event-based surveillance, and the blue boxes were uh, existing Ministry of Health structures. As you can see, our goal was not necessarily to create a standalone surveillance program, but simply to improve case finding uh, and integrate our program within the Ebola response structures that were already set up. So the timeline for implementation. Um, in November 2014, we conducted a pilot in around 100 villages in Bow District in the center of the country. December 2014, we developed a standard operating procedures with the Ministry of Health. They asked us to scale the program nationally. And then from January to April, it was scaled up nationally by the Ebola Response Consortium, uh, which was an alliance of NGOs that was formed and led by the IRC to enable, essentially, for NGOs to implement Ebola response programming in a standardized way at national scale to make sure we were all doing the same thing. Uh, and three districts were scaled up by IFRC, the Red Cross, uh, using very similar SOPs. So during that time, we trained over 7,000 community health monitors and 150 supervisors across the nine districts. And many of these were pre-existing community health uh, workers. So Rowan's going to take over and talk a bit more about the evaluation. <coughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'll now talk about the epidemiological evaluation. Uh, so for the methods, uh, first, we anticipated that a community surveillance program would be uh, more sensitive and, and much less specific. Therefore, we wanted to investigate whether 
uh, the system was capable and effective in detecting suspect, probable, and confirmed cases. Um, so this entailed a basic descriptive analysis of alerts across space and time. Um, across nine districts from the start of operations, which was in February 2015, to the end of the study period, which was September 30th. Um, we looked at sensitivity and positive predictive value, sensitivity of confirmed case detection, which basically looked at the proportion of confirmed cases detected through community event-based surveillance among all of the confirmed cases detected through the overall surveillance system. Positive predictive value looked at the proportion of suspect, probable, and confirmed cases detected uh, through the alert system uh, among all alerts detected through uh, community event-based surveillance. Finally, uh, given its potential for early warning, we wanted to know whether uh, community event-based surveillance filled a surveillance gap by detecting unknown chains of transmission in a timely manner. Um, so we conducted field investigations in the only district still reporting cases at the time, which was Cambia, um, to look at uh, timeliness um, and the source of the surveillance detection during the first six weeks of operation in Cambia. Over to the results. Um, what you're looking at is a graph of the number of alerts over time. Since uh, community event-based surveillance began its operations on February 27th until the end of the study period in September 30th, 2015, the system generated over 12,000 alerts. By the end of April, eight of the nine districts were online, and by the middle of June, all nine districts were reporting an average of 79 alerts per day. When we looked at the breakdown of alerts, we see that only 5% of alerts total were listed as one of the six predefined trigger events. The other category that Joe mentioned earlier uh, was made up 95% uh, made up of the alerts, and 87% of the other category alerts related to deaths happening in the community that may or may not have been related to uh, Ebola. However, the death reporting rates uh, by district, which are the white bars you see there, were considerably lower than the anticipated um, accrued death rate of 4.66 deaths per 100,000 per day, which is shown by the yellow line. So it was not exactly uh, mortality surveillance, but it showed a continual flow of uh, death reporting. Uh, bear with me, I'm just gonna skip over these slides and come back. Um, so for sensitivity and pod positive predictive value, um, the sensitivity was 30%. Uh, the system detected 16 of the 53 confirmed cases recorded in the ministry database in the nine districts. Um, half of those 16 cases were alive when found. Um, the positive predictive value was 2.4%. Um, which meant 287 alerts produced uh, suspect, probable, or confirmed cases that warranted further investigation. In addition, though unintended, measles clusters were signaled um, through the system. Um, as, as I said before, Cambia was the only district reporting cases during the field investigation period. Um, the investigations we did uh, aimed to demonstrate how health facility screening, community event-based surveillance, and contact tracing were involved in the detection of uh, cases in a timely manner. Here we see a community health monitor who's part of the SEBS program, um, who is also a community health worker, recounting the detection of a case in Cambia. Uh, similarly, here's a surveillance supervisor who's seeking preliminary information on, on a case that's just been phoned in. And here, this is a typical screening post in a health facility that was also involved in detection of one of the cases. Um, this chart demonstrates the timeliness of case detection of the six cases uh, from unknown chains of transmission in Cambia. That was the culmination of these field investigations. During the time period, six of the 13 confirmed cases were shown to have not appeared on any contact list or been under contact tracing. Uh, community event-based surveillance detected four of six of these cases fairly quickly, uh, a range of one to three days from date of onset of symptoms. And the other two cases, which were not detected by community event-based surveillance, took five and seven days each for uh, detection. However, these data are too small to draw a meaningful conclusion on timeliness. As with any study, uh, we have limitations. First, uh, since transmission had declined substantially uh, at the time of evaluation, uh, it was not possible to determine how community event-based surveillance performed during a high transmission time. 
Second, field investigations were carried out on a small subset of the total 53 confirmed cases, so it was difficult to say um, what the relative contributions of community surveillance and contact tracing were. And third, as evidenced by the low use of triggers for illness, social and anthropological questions around illness detection are very important, and we really focused on the epidemiological questions. So to conclude, um, rumor-based surveillance systems are, can be implemented nationally during a humanitarian emergency. Uh, this was a productive system that produced a lot of alerts, and it also helped to confirm that zero transmission was happening in quieter areas where confirmed cases were being uh, detected much less. SEBS did generate a lot of false alerts. It was reasonably sensitive in that it detected a third of cases, um, and many of the other cases were already under contact tracing. It does fill a surveillance gap. It rapidly detected uh, four out of six cases from unknown chains of transmission, um, so it suggests that it's timely. Um, but there was a poor use of triggers, as uh, described. Looking forward, um, we take two important lessons from this experience. Community health worker systems or other community systems are integrated already in communities and are key for the rapid rollout of surveillance systems. Uh, this is important as there's discussions and actions to build longer-term detection capacity through community networks as a building block of integrated disease surveillance and response systems in West Africa. Um, also, less is more. Um, deaths and simple validated events and case definitions are very important to uh, instill from the onset. Um, the, our, our study shows that uh, reinforcement of training after a rapid implementation process is very important. Thank you very much. If you want to learn more, please see these papers. It's one of my favorite pictures from the outbreak. And we gratefully acknowledge the CDC, Ebola Response Consortium partners, Sierra Leone Ministry of Health, and funding from our donors. Thank you.